It's great to welcome to the program today Daniel Markovitz, who's a professor of law at the Yale Law School and also author of the book The Meritocracy Trap, How America's Foundational Myth Feeds Inequality, Dismantles the Middle Class and Devours the Elite. Uh, Daniel, so great to have you on today. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you for doing this. So maybe maybe just to start with, let's start with what what maybe is the top line story that's often told, which is the great thing about America is that it's a meritocracy. Everybody has a chance at making it if they are whatever enough committed enough, if they want it enough, regardless of background or economic status, et cetera. How can we evaluate the truth or falsity of that sort of top line story? Yeah, great. So what you've done is you've identified what makes meritocracy so attractive. It seems like it gives everybody a fair shot at success if they just have the hard work and talent. And it seems that it produces an elite that's really capable because it's proved itself in competition. And for a while, meritocracy worked that way. In its early years, it broke up an old hereditary aristocracy. But then what happened is that people who got to the top through meritocracy themselves turn out to have an almost unbounded taste and talent for training their children. And so the elite today invests so much more in educating its children than anybody else can possibly afford to do. And education works, which means that when you measure young people based on their academic accomplishments, it's the kids of rich parents who do best and meritocracy then perpetuates itself and creates a new kind of aristocracy just based on degrees rather than breeding. And that sort of assumes that there is at least some zero sum nature to elements of our society and the economy. Right. I mean, if one wanted to play devil's advocate, they could say, great. Once someone through their work achieves, they become good at training their kids and their kids and their kids. And that's fine. As long as everybody else is not disadvantaged as a result of that, then it would still be OK. Right. So I think there are two there are two responses to that. That's I think that's a powerful point. The first is there is inevitably some zero sum competition so that education is a, you know, a rank good. And the value of my education depends on how much education the person behind me in the job line has. But the other deeper point is that this new elite has fundamentally reconstructed the way our economy works, the way we deliver services, the way we make goods so that the new economy privileges specifically the narrow set of elite skills that fancy educations give and devalues all other skills so that the rich today, when they succeed, more nearly push everybody else down than drag, draw everybody else up. So if we concede that certainly we, we don't have a full meritocracy, I think before we, we explore some of the specifics in more detail, it might be interesting to consider would a would a true meritocracy really be the ideal in and we can approach that from a few different perspectives but maybe just I'll start with that question what what would be good about an actually meritocratic society and what might be not so good yeah so from my perspective i want to be clear a full meritocracy would not be the ideal it would be more nearly a nightmare um what would be good about it though and it has some good things is that it would undermine all sorts of hierarchies and inequalities that are morally awful, hierarchies based on race or caste or gender or sexual orientation or ethnicity, those are all despised by meritocracy. And one of the reasons why meritocracy is so attractive is that it works to undermine those. On the other hand, what it would also do is it would create a new hierarchy based on training, based on how much training your parents could buy for you, and it would produce incredibly unequal outcomes. And if there's one lesson of the book that I think is really important to drive home, it's that the idea that equality of opportunity can make unequal outcomes OK is a moral mistake. And what we need is more equality of outcomes in our world. Can you say more about that? Because it might I mean, that we, we have even though my audience is mostly on the left, I think that there's probably a range of opinions in terms of the degree to which equality of opportunity would be the goal versus equality of outcome. Can you talk a little bit more about because equality of outcome can mean a lot of different things and, and maybe yeah. as to, to contextualize it, one of the things that seems immutable in, in humanity is that uh, there is rarely uh, 
exact distribution in any field or venture that mirrors the makeup of society, whether it's in terms of gender, race, uh, age, whatever. Right. So right. if we start with that reality, equality of outcome can sound pretty scary in some ways. Yeah, sure. And uh, it's also important to say uh, I'm not and I don't think anybody serious is in favor of absolute equality of outcome. You know, the way in which like Procrustes used to chop people off if they were too long for the bed he stuck them in. That, that's a, a, a deeply dangerous notion. But right now, we have so much inequality of outcome that it's hard really to recognize how extreme it is. The richest 1% of Americans today control a greater share of the nation's income and wealth than, for example, a comparable elite did in ancient Rome during the era of imperial decadence. So we have inequality of outcome that is just extravagantly skewed. And when that happens, elites use whatever selection mechanism there is to privilege their own kids. And so when you get sufficiently big inequality of outcomes, you can't have equality of opportunity. Just to give you a way of thinking about that very quickly, in our country today, if you take the difference between what a typical 1% household invests in educating its children and what a typical middle class household invests, so not a poor household, but a middle class household. And every year you take that difference and you put it in the S&P 500 to create an inheritance that will go to the rich kids when their parents die. That would be well north of $10 million per child. And that produces a massive skew in who gets ahead. And it's driven by the inequality of outcomes in the prior generation. And that's unjust. Has, has this been a change in the last 20 or 30 years? And by that, I mean a change in the direction of uh, less conspicuous spending by the very rich, let less about things that immediately uh, show wealth, like you know, watches or expensive cars or whatever the case, but a, a type of spending on education and upbringing that maybe has a more pervasive effect in perpetuating inequality. Well, I think two things have happened, and the underlying driver of this is the rich have just gotten so much richer. So one thing that's happened is that the rich are actually spending more on consumption and luxury kinds of goods than they used to. But because there are no, now so many rich people, they don't stand out in the same way. There are whole enclaves, there are whole superstructures built to service rich consumption. You know, there are increasingly, some places they have separate airline terminals for the richest passengers, so you don't see them. But it's also the case, as you say, that no part of consumption inequality has grown faster than inequality in spending on education. Mm. And it's um, absolutely enormous when we think about. So to go back a little bit, because I think this might be an interesting area. And oh, I, I should mention, we've been speaking with Daniel Markovitz. We're going to go to a break on the TV, radio and podcast episode. But the conversation will continue in full on our YouTube channel. If we want to evaluate, let's just pick something right, like representation of women in the U.S. Senate, just because it's a simple hundred and it just makes the math sort of simple, right? Women make up just more than 50 percent of the population of the country and they don't make up 50 percent of the Senate. I actually don't have the exact number right now in front of me. If the Senate is five percent women, I think you would get a lot of people who say there's more than mere chance going on. It's likely more than just women aren't interested in being in the Senate. But if it's 37 percent or maybe 41 percent at, at a certain point, we would be able to determine that the variance is is maybe acceptable or within some yeah. kind of tolerance. How do we evaluate something like that? Well, I think with respect to class and education, we are so far from that. We're more like the 5% case. So mm. here's a, a striking fact. At Harvard, Princeton, Yale, and Stanford, there are more kids whose parents are in the top 1% of the income distribution than the bottom 60%. So that's the kind of skew we're looking at. A at the same time, it also matters how we support these institutions. So that Princeton, for example, because it's taxed as a tax exempt organization, doesn't pay tax on its endowment income, has alumni who can deduct from taxes their contributions. And that amounts to an implicit public subsidy of $100,000 a year per Princeton student, compared to public spending of $12,500 a year at the State University of New Jersey at Rutgers, 
and public spending of about $2,500 a year at Essex County Community College. So the Princeton kids get a public subsidy that is 40 times as big as the community college kids up the road, even though there are more kids at Princeton from the richest 1% than from the bottom 60%. So it's both that there's this massive skew and then there's this massive public subsidy the rest of society is paying to the rich kids who get the benefit of the skew. Yeah, I mean, and 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 that that makes a lot of sense. And that's a, a really good, good example, I guess, just in thinking about if we want to a priority for me is to figure out where the worst problems are and to signal them where maybe we might have the opportunity of making the largest correction, so to speak. And in thinking about that, it, just to give another specific example, like a hard and fast example, if we identify that um, the percentage of uh, doctors, for example, who are black is dramatically lower in a certain special call it dermatologists, for example, in the dermatology field, black folks make up. I don't remember if it's 17 percent of the country's population, but they make up only four percent of dermatologists as an example. How can we empirically determine the causes for that and determine where the causes may be pernicious and where they may be the result of other less less dangerous factors? Yeah. So, um, you know, for class, one way in which we can determine the causes is by working through the actual mechanisms whereby people get ahead. Look at what percentage of professional parents send their children to really high quality preschools and what percentage of middle class parents or what percentage of working class parents do. And you see a massive difference. Mm. Look at how much is spent on high school kids. Um, the typical public high school, the medium public high school in America spends between 12 and $15,000 per pupil per year on educating its students. The Forbes top 20 private schools spend about $75,000 per pupil per year on educating their students. And unsurprisingly, those schools send maybe a third of their kids to the Ivy League or to Stanford, Chicago, Duke. Now, what that is doing is it's showing you what the mechanism is. The mechanism is this hugely disproportionate investment in much more intensive education, which produces much better outcomes on standardized tests. And then the kids go to the colleges that dominate the income leagues when they graduate. So in, in class, we can trace out the micro mechanisms that are producing this skew, which gives us a pretty high degree of confidence that it's run through a system of self perpetuating elites, which I think most of us would object to. Yeah, I think one of the things that's interesting about that is when we think about um, equality of opportunity versus equality of outcome, I think that at least in some cases, what is claimed to be an equality of opportunity really is not. In other words, rather than maybe before I would even go to equality of outcome, I might first start on. There's a lot of allegations about equality of opportunity that aren't really there. I mean, the school thing is an example, right? In theory, everyone has the opportunity to go to these schools, but in practice, they don't because the schools cost money. Yeah, right. And, and so one there are two important points there. One is a conceptual point to be really clear about which is that meritocracy is not the same thing as equality of opportunity. So meritocracy is you measure people based on their accomplishments. But if it turns out that to accomplish something, you need practice training investment in your talents and people get different amounts of investment in their talents, then when you accurately measure people based on their accomplishments, you violate equality of opportunity. And so meritocracy, which was sold to America as the handmaiden of equality of opportunity, has in fact become an obstacle to equality of opportunity. What about on the other side of a meritocracy? And I think maybe at the beginning of our conversation, when you said that a full meritocracy actually would would be very bad in some ways, uh, you know, when people say, hey, if unemployment's too high, a lot of people will choose not to work because they'd rather the unemployment. I don't worry about something like that because the truth is most people want to work and there's value in doing things I, like I just don't worry about the free rider problem. But it's certainly true that in a distribution of humans, there are people whose accomplishments, even when given opportunities, might not be that good. And I don't think they deserve to be left behind. And that seems to be a problem on the other side of a true meritocracy. 
So this is a big problem, and it's a problem even in the idealized case that you describe and a much bigger problem in our actual case. So even in the idealized case, what meritocracy says is that if you don't succeed, it's your fault. And so it adds a kind of moral insult to the economic and social injury of being left behind. And even when the meritocracy is fair, that's not a very humane way of dealing with people. Hmm. But when the meritocracy on top of that is unfair, and you have a huge segment of the population, you know, 70, 80 percent of the population that is structurally excluded from advantage by all the ways in which the rich out invest in their children. And then because we pretend it's a meritocracy, society says to people who didn't get ahead, it's your fault that you didn't get ahead. You didn't measure up. You know, then you get a sort of dark psychology of allegedly justified disadvantage. And that turns people into uh, you know, racist populists. It turns people into forms of self-hatred and self-destruction. And, and it, it, it accounts for a large share, I think, of the social and political dysfunction that we face in our country today. So when I try to apply these issues that you raise in the book to different political systems, I have a bias in that I tend to go towards the ideas of northern European social democracy as as pretty good for a lot of circumstances. And what I like about that framework when we think about a meritocracy is that there is opportunity for people to do well and very, very well. But there are mechanisms to sort of at the top put in some safeguards that can be reallocated to the bottom to make sure that there are fewer or or less severe losers from meritocracy. It, do you agree in terms of the political systems uh, in terms of social democracy dealing with this or what political solutions do you see? I think I share your politics. I may be a little to the left of that vision myself, but um, it's important to me to distinguish my own private political views from the analysis of the book. And sure. I think the analysis of the book is very much in line with that. I think one thing I'd add to that is it's important to separate uh, what we might call excellence from superiority. So excellence is being good enough at something worth doing to make doing it worthwhile. Superiority is being better than somebody else at something. And one of the other features of Northern European social democracy is that they emphasize excellence and de-emphasize superiority. So their banking system, for example, finance in Germany, is managed by a bunch of trained up local bankers who are good at delivering banking services, but are not super competitive, desiring to be superior to others at trading complicated derivatives, because that turns out not to be very socially useful. And so you want to temper inequality both through redistribution, but also by structuring your economy in such a way that you create lots of opportunities for people to do worthwhile jobs well, without worrying about whether they're doing them better than the next guy which may not actually be socially very important. Yeah, that's an that's an important distinction that is totally absent in the American finance system anyway, uh, and, and probably in, in many others. The book is the meritocracy trap, how America's foundational myth feeds inequality, dismantles the middle class and devours the elite. We've been speaking with the book's author, Daniel Markovitz. Uh, Daniel, so appreciate your time today. I'm so grateful for yours. It's been a real pleasure speaking and also listening. So thanks very much.